to get where you want to go or to get further along, there's typically a period where I have to slow down and slowing down can and oftentimes does come with some level of financial risk. Welcome back to the Millennial Dentist Podcast, a podcast all about working smarter, not harder, pushing dentists to go beyond dental school dentistry and build the practice of your dreams. Here is your host, the Millennial Dentist himself, Dr. Sully Sullivan. Welcome back, everybody, to the Millennial Dentist Podcast. I'm super pumped to be recording from my studio that's now in my office completed, so uh, check us out. We're on YouTube now. We're going to be doing Facebook Live pretty soon. I want to do these live. That'd be kind of fun. And uh, yeah, I got a pretty sweet setup. So if you want to see the video footage and watch it, you can go there. Um, or you can just keep listening in your car or your pods, whatever's good. But anyways, uh, what a summer. I don't know about y'all, but like it was busier. I feel like they just get busier. And then, um, yeah, it kind of ties into something I want to talk about tonight. Growth is hard because with growth comes the level of um, risk. I've had a couple calls lately with people who uh, are in positions like where they they could they could grow a lot, but it comes with a financial risk, and that's kind of something I want to talk about that I've experienced this summer myself, and and so I want to touch base on. So, anyways, um, the podcast isn't sponsored by anybody, but obviously. You should support 3D Dentist, so go to 3D-Dentist.com um, for our courses. Mastermind 2024 January is sold out, so um, if you want to get on that, which I think it's the best program we offer, then your next shot's going to be July 2024, so don't wait. Go over, sign up for that. Anyways, when you talk about like <clears throat> growth, so I'll give a little bit of an example, then I'll jump into some more realistic examples, but so for my practice this year, we hired two new doctors this summer. So we were at four doctors, my dad, myself, two other doctors, and we've made the jump now to go to add two more. We had the general dentist and we just added a periodontist. Now, part of, I think the, what I want to talk about is the, the going all in with hiring these people full time. So I've had a number of conversations lately with people who they're concerned, or I guess they just want to hedge their bets by bringing on people part time. And I think that's difficult when you look at the cam competitive landscape of corporate dentistry. So when you talk about growth, almost all growth is associated with some level of financial risk. It's this idea of slow down to speed up, right? Like I talk about it, you hear others talk about it, but to, to get where you want to go or to get further along, there's typically a period where I have to slow down and slowing down can and oftentimes does come with some level of financial risk, especially in our profession because um, we're in a profession where if you're the owner, you're the owner of your business and you're the primary producer in the business. That's kind of a weird thing compared to most industries where um, you've got other producers and maybe the owner isn't the primary producer, where in our cases it is. So yeah, when you slow down to speed up, you're going to have a setback in production. So I'll, I'll kind of give an example of my scenario. So I bring on these two docs and naturally if I'm going to bring on two docs at the same time, onboarding these doctors, it's not like there's just this unbelievable amount of production sitting there waiting to give to them, right? I mean, it's not like I have that backlog of production. And there's training, there's communication. Uh, I, I give David a hard time. He's the periodontist, but I call him my baby periodontist because he's run out of school. So, you know, his communication is the same as a general dentist run out of school. Like it's basically on par with what you're taught in dental school and, you know, we over science, we techno babble them. It's it's somewhat of a I love you, David, but a disaster at first. And so trying to, you know, train and teach these doctors to communicate and and whatnot requires a stepping back. So if I'm gonna step back, I'm gonna stop producing, there's gonna be a time period where my production takes a hit and maybe their production doesn't ramp up to cover that, cover that hit. So um that takes financial flexibility. Now, what I mean by financial flexibility is, because I think we have to define that term before we move on much, because I'm not talking about the convoluted and necessary different ways to retire or investment opportunities. I'm talking about like having money in the bank, both business and personal, 
from a saving standpoint that allows you to weather storms. So in like life, you know, we talk about like having an emergency fund, like like a three month or six month emergency fund, whatever it looks like, so that if if something happens where you know you lose your job, something happens to the house, car breaks down, you've got this money to weather the storms. Well, it's no real different in our businesses that we need to build up some level of financial flexibility to take risks. And I don't think it's talked about it often enough because that that flexibility that you have financially for me to say, hey, if I don't get a paycheck this month, it's okay, really gives us a significant amount of position to pivot and scale and grow our businesses at a quicker rate. Because if I bring in one doctor, I probably slow down a little bit. If I bring in two doctors, I definitely am going to have to slow down a bit. So for me, my production went to, and 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 remember, like I, I do mainly specialty dentistry now, so I do I do a high production number a month, and I'm not bragging. I'm just saying like I mainly do fixed hybrids. So um, my average production is probably 150 to 160 a month, which is still low probably for a specialist, but it's a high level of production. You know, you do the math on 30 percent or 32 percent or whatever, and and that's what I normally would take home on a month to month basis. That's what on some level I'm accustomed to. Now, fast forward to July, 2023, we bring on these two docs. I scale back significantly. I produce 40 grand in the month of July, 40 grand. So if it's a hundred grand and it's 30, and I'm getting 30%, that's a $30,000 hit that I took in July. And that could be super intimidating. And on some level, when I say out loud, I'm like, shit, the bed. But the reality is, is it's just looking at things from a long game perspective. Because if we're limited by our own capacity, I can only run so hard. 150 a month, 200 a month, like what, what's the number that you're going to get to? But if I can scale people around me, now all of a sudden my potential as a business becomes limitless. So now instead of having myself be the only producer. Now I can have my dad as a surgical producer, David as a periodontist as a surgical producer, and then three GPs downstairs. We now have such a bit ability to scale at some point. So it's an idea of saying, okay, I'm willing to take a haircut in the short term because I financially set myself up by putting money away, not living within my, you know, within my means, not overspending in certain areas, so that I can then pivot or make decisions when I find good people, find a good product, find a good piece of technology that I can then take the risk and maybe maybe have to weather some short, short-term benefit to see where I get. So I'll be interested to see. And obviously the story really is, un- is still in process, right? Because, um, yeah, I took a significant pay cut in July, a significant pay cut in August. And now we're at a point where I've got, I want, I'm at 60 days, basically. I want to start to see a return in our business starting to move up. Because if y'all looked at our top line number, what do you think it did in July and August? It really probably stayed the same. There was no growth because my production hedged the growth of the associates. Or, or, and in my case, they probably didn't as much because Uh, I was doing hybrids, but it did because my hybrids went to my dad and my dad's advanced dentistry went to the periodontist. So I'm going to restore to the advanced dentist, went to the other associates so that their dentistry could go down to Sarah as the new GP. Everybody follow that? So there's this, this replacing yourself that starts from the top that my dentistry goes to my dad's, my dad's goes to David and some of it goes to Megan and Amber so that their, their dentistry that they can give away then falls down to Sarah. And I did a podcast a couple of months ago uh, called, you know, which if you have listened to, I encourage you to go back, which talks about feeding your associates first. And that's the mentality that I live by, that I will grow their plates knowing that I will it'll come full circle once I grow them to where I'm the easy one to refill because I've got the largest skill set. Um, I think I have the best communication skills, you know, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying this, me personally, I'm saying this me is the owner doctor in your practice. So so all this is to say that you've got to get to a point where you have that wherewithal to take that risk to make those jumps. So I'm talking to a dentist um, earlier today, and she's looking at bringing on an associate. 
like most doctors do, they want to hedge their risks. And so instead of offering this person four days a week, they want to offer them two days a week. And like, I don't have a problem with part-time work. And I think it's a good, and not everybody's like a jump in the deep end pool like I am. Um, but I want you to think about it from a recruitment standpoint. Because when we live in a world like we do today, where there's a corporate competitor on some on every street corner for the most part, or within every city for the most part, of the offices that we work in, we have to look at what people can say yes to if we if we're only offering them so much. So if you're in you're a dentist and you're coming out, or you're in this case this this dentist is a seasoned veteran, they've got they can place implants, they can do sedation, they can do root canals, and you're in a position where I can take the corporate job with a, a higher guaranteed payment and four days a week versus a, you know, private practice office where I take a lower pay cut and I work two days a week and I've just bought a house. I've done things that like, like that you owner doctor may agree with or not agree with, but I've done these. So now financially I need this money. Which option are you taking? So, so my argument is, is if we want to have the right people, we have to, on some level, be competitive in what we're offering. And, and I think I'm more competitive if I can offer a four-day or a full-time gig with an equal guaranteed payment, knowing that I've got a strategy and how I, how I fill that. Now, the naysayers may be like, well, obviously, you can't necessarily get their production up um, fast enough or... I don't have enough dentistry to have someone four days. And like my response to that is bullshit because there's plenty of dentistry to go around. Most of us are on such a hamster wheel that we don't have time to slow down to diagnose appropriately. We're not taking photos on our patients. We're not communicating in a way. And goodness gracious, we have no way for people to pay for things outside of cash check or, or care credit. And so dentistry is unaffordable and we're not presenting all the things that are there. So you know, and I go back to like looking at my own practice when I joined the practice, you know, the idea, and I think most dentists, their mentality is that when you bring on an associate, you've got to double the patients. That you got to double your new patients and they're, they're wrong. Like there's so much dentistry within practices because of the busyness of the practices that with the first associate hire, you really don't need any more patients. Now, there are some assumptions I'm making there. <clears throat> One assumption is that where we have some level of alternative skill sets, meaning that the owner doctor is has a skill set that's underutilized because of their business, busyness. So maybe they can do surgery, maybe they can place implants, but they're too busy to truly get the the all of the the on the table there because they're doing billings, grounds, et cetera. Um, their hygiene exams are two minutes because they're having to get back to the chair. Or you're recruiting an associate that does dentistry you don't. You know, for me, when I came into my dad's practice, dad was doing no ortho. So I went out and took six months miles. So immediately I came in and, you know, I was probably averaging two starts a month. Two starts a month, the time I think I was only charging $3,500. That's seven grand a month in production that I was getting out of the gate from dentistry that was not even, that was same patient base, sitting in the practice, not being done. That's those are the things that I think that you have to look at is okay, where where is the dentistry coming from? How do I support them? And then this ties into I think the next thing that people push back to, which is the guaranteed payment. So I want to walk through a little bit of this math to help the listeners truly understand the risk of onboarding an associate. And you can do this really with any team member. It's not just a doctor, but any any team member as well. So when you bring on an associate, there's there's a reality that there's going to be a guaranteed payment. So they're going to want some guarantee for some period of time. In our office, we typically do somewhere between, you know, $600 to $800 uh, for the general dentist for six months. So they've got a six-month guarantee that the days they work, they're going to get that money no matter what. So now, as the owner doctor, I know that I've got that number that I want to at least get them to that production. So on some level, I break even. That's kind of the, the number we think of. Let's use let's use 30% because I think that's a fair number. 30% of adjusted production, it could be 32%, whatever that number looks like. But 30%, and let's say I pay them $700. So 700 um, divided by 0.3 is $2,300. So all this dentist needs to do a day 
with exams, radiographs, and any dentistry that they do. And I'm talking about radiographs that are in their chair. That's a common question that gets asked, not hygiene radiographs. All they got to do is $2,300 a day. So that's not a lot of money. Per, I, don't, I don't think. I'm not a lot of production. I mean, $2,300 a day um, times 16 is going to equate to $37,000 a month in production. That's the, the break-even number. Now, I think what's important to realize is it's not really the true break-even number. And the reason it's not a true break-even number is because in, you, you should be, assuming that your practice is running within some realm of, of good numbers, you should be making some percentage off them as well. So you're not, it's not a true one-to-one, -one, like I got to hit that number, I don't break even, because you're making money along the way with all the dentistry they do. Just to kind of clarify, so if, you're, if your adjusted production is, excuse me, if your overhead 60% and you're paying them 30%, then that means that there's 10% that you make on every dollar they do. Like that's a, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good idea. So now all of a sudden my, um, if they're doing $37,000, 10%, I'm making four grand on that. So I really got to take basically 30, 37, you know, you get what I'm saying, but I got to take that number off the top. So really the break even number is actually more like 33,000, 32,000, some number less than that number. Now, yes, yeah, some of you may say, well, you got to bring on an assistant. Yeah, absolutely. But, but your, your general overhead should actually decrease with another doctor because you're not necessarily adding more hygienists. You're not adding more front office teamers. Most time when you're adding a new doctor, you're just adding most likely a new assistant. So a relatively cost-effective employee relative to the overhead that you have. So as your production goes up, your overhead that should then go, go down because it's not increasing at the same level that your expenses are. So that I think is a um, important point to note and kind of take advantage of and understand. So my point all this is saying is that we get so tied up in these daily minimums when they really shouldn't even matter. Like if I'm having a doctor only do that $2,700 a day, I got to take a look internally in our systems and how we're doing things. Because if we're only diet, if they're, if they're only getting, you know, two crowns a day or a crown and a couple fillings a day, then like we, we do need to look at our communication process, our diagnosis process. Like there is a fundamental issue there. Um, especially if I'm adding skill sets that I don't have or if, again, I am able to get things off my plate so that I can then do more. So we, we, we look at that in, in our practice by block scheduling, right? Like we start blocking um, less, dentist, less of the dentistry I don't want to do so that it funnels it to the doctors that need the dentistry. So if you're a one doctor practice and you're bringing on an associate, you're going to start limiting the amount of fillings you do. I'm not saying get rid of them. I'm just saying start limiting them. So at what point you're booked out three weeks then the patient has the option of, okay, I can, I can see them, um, or, or I can, uh, you, you can see them and wait. The patient can wait on you and then see them, or the patient could see the other doctor in a reasonable amount of time. That's how we funnel patients to the associates. So, uh, I just think we had to take a look at this differently, and we've got to do two things. One is we've got to build financial flexibility to the point that we can take risks. You've got to have some money set aside so that when you get opportunities, you can take risks. Marketing's a risk. Marketing is spending money hoping that it brings in patients. The more I market, the more chance I have a return, the more chance I can grow my business, but that takes risk because there's a good chance that for the first month, marketing doesn't work. Second month, maybe it doesn't work. In a lot of cases, it's the third or fourth month where that finally kicks in and you may have already turned off the marketing because you didn't see the immediate result because you start feeling the hit. It's the same thing with an associate. You're not going to see some crazy return on that employee for maybe a couple months. Now, I've been fortunate that historically in our practice, we start to see return on that employee, meaning that we're not losing money on them by the end of month one or month two. But it's possible that without the kind of systems and some of that stuff in place, that it's going to take 60, 90, 120 days where I don't expect to lose money on them the whole way. But I may, I may just be breaking even or not seeing it. it it's going to feel like way more work than it's worth. But that's that's the that's the that's the commitment level that it takes to get to the other side. And so 
my encouragement is if if you don't have that or if you're an associate or currently now, building financial flexibility gives you the ability to take risks, therefore the ability to grow at an exponential rate. And in hindsight, I got so lucky early on because when I bought in the half of this practice and we were starting to grow at a fast rate, I had dual income, wife was working, no kids. So for me, there was excess. She had a good job. I was making good money. So I was just like, yeah, gasoline on the fire, gasoline on the fire, gasoline on the fire. Every opportunity that I would, that we came that looked like it would help grow the business, we just reinvested. So, um, and this is, gosh, I could go on and on and on about this. I think this is another reason, and, and I'll, I'll piggyback this onto another episode, but this is why, as a solo doc owner, you've got to separate your associate income as yourself, meaning you as the doctor and you as the business owner. Because my encouragement to you all is if you can live off of your just your doctor income, then your business income can slowly accumulate to give you the level of risk to take advantage of what you need to go, go and do. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, I gotta go check a patient. They're knocking on my window, um, but I'm excited to be back at it, excited of your recording. If you've got content, I would love to know. Please hit me up, um, at Millennial Dentist on Instagram, millennialdentist at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be a, a fun fall. I'm excited. Ready for some football season. Work smarter, not harder. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Millennial Dentist. Visit us online at millennialdentist.com.